Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Anya Light. I am an intuitive life coach and a Reiki teacher and a facilitator of awesome conversations with awesome people. So I'm very happy today to continue with our conversation on platonic touch. This is part two of our conversation. This is a conversation in three parts. So we'll be doing the final part next Sunday. And last week we set the groundwork for this conversation and we define what platonic touch is and what can be some of the benefits of platonic touch and what are some of the cultural taboos that we have to work against when we want to learn about platonic touch and actively seek to bring it into our lives. So that was what we did last week. As kind of a recap, platonic touch can be thought of as meeting with our friends in ways that defy the cultural norms. Um, we come together with our friends for extended touch. So whether that's long, long hugs, whether that's cuddling on the couch together, whether that's cuddle parties, whether that's um, different kinds of body work. There's many different ways, but basically the idea of platonic is non-sexual touch. And we're not in any way saying sex is bad or anything like that. We're just saying there's many options for people to explore the healing powers of touch. And for many of us, you know, um, we want more than, like if we are not in a romantic partnership at the time, Maybe we want more than um, booking a massage treatment. Maybe we want to be really, really intimate and close with the people, our friends, with people we love. So this conversation hopefully will help to facilitate you bringing more platonic touch into your life or just considering, considering that. Or maybe some of you already are doing that. And I do happen to know some of you who are here are already practicing platonic touch. And I'm hoping that you can give insights later in the conversation. So today we're talking about how to do it. Last week we we opened the subject, but now we get into the the nitty-gritty, the how, the how-to. Cuz it's easy to talk about something in an idealistic way like let's just do this, but let's dive in. How do we do this? So the first thing is platonic touch rests totally and completely on the notion of consent. We need to create safe spaces by honoring the rules and the games, the rule and the, the game of consent. And what does consent mean? Consent means that we come together with people and we do our very best, the very best that we can, not to manipulate others in any way, not even subtly. So we're very clear within ourselves to constantly be checking in with our own self, our own heart, and saying, am I acting in a way that could be subtly manipulative, trying to get what I want from someone else, maybe without consideration of how they're feeling? So consent is all about adults, mature adults coming together and saying, Let's agree, do we want to engage in a certain kind of behavior or activity? And we're all totally in agreement with it. We're all totally desiring it. We're all totally on board with it. No one is like a maybe. No one's kind of tentative about it. Everyone's like, yes, this is what I want to do. And let's talk about the rules and the boundaries and the agreements. And it was all get on the same page. So we all feel comfortable and excited to move forward. So that's the idea of consent. So we create safe spaces by playing together with, with the idea of consent. Is this consensual? Is every part of this interaction consensual for all the people involved? So when we are, first of all, 
a really basic question comes up in terms of like the how to, how do we choose people to do this with? How do we know who might be a good candidate for a platonic touch partner? And when I say partner, I don't necessarily mean that you have to do it multiple times over a long period of time, but just a partner is in one specific moment, afternoon, evening, one meeting. How do you pick? How do you select? How do you know who would be a good candidate for that? So that's the first question that we can ask ourselves. And my advice would be, um, and let me preface this by saying all the stuff I'm saying um, part of why I'm so passionate about this topic is because I am, um, I have experience hosting cuddle parties. So back, oh, about, I don't know, six or seven years ago, um, when I was married at the time to a wonderful man named Andrew, um, we were very passionate about platonic touch and we would host cuddle parties in our home, which was great. And so we would send the rules out that we had created to create the safe space, the comfort for everyone to feel safe. We would send, we would email those out to people in advance and have them read them and then agree. So basically by the time that everyone showed up for the event, everyone was on the same page. And that was great. And the, these cuddle parties were fabulous. In fact, um, yeah, I would say one of the rules that we did have was no alcohol or drugs because we wanted everyone to have a clear mind so that we could all follow the rules <laughs> and just be very present with each other because alcohol and drugs changes your mindset. So, but even without the, the drugs and alcohol, we all commented after enduring these parties, all of the people that were there, that was the highest, some of the highest experiences we've all ever experienced. I mean, like, imagine all your best friends laying on, we would um, blow up this giant air mattress and, like, put it in the middle of our living room, and we'd have, like, five or six people all just piled on <laughs> top of it. All clothes stayed on. This wasn't about sex. This wasn't about, like, seduction or, like, touching anyone in any sort of more sexual areas, but this was like just loving each other. And you know, it was funny, like when we would try to stand up to to go get a drink of water, or go to the bathroom, we'd all be like stumbling around because we were so high. Oh, it was so nice. But I digress. Um, so I have hosted a number of cuddle parties. And so I do have experience in creating safe spaces like this. So the first thing is looking at how do you pick a cuddle partner or um, how do you know who you want to cuddle with? And my advice would be um, two things. Number one, is this a person? So if you're thinking of someone in particular and wondering, like, is this a person that might be a good person to cuddle with or to share platonic touch with? My if you think about this person, is there a lot of emotional baggage that comes with this person? So not everyone is a good candidate, even if you really love them. So as an example, maybe an ex-boyfriend or an ex-girlfriend or an ex-spouse, maybe there's some unresolved issues that you have with them. And that's not like a negative judgment. It's just the truth. You have some unresolved stuff and you're not... There's just stuff. So you, if that's there, if there's a little bit of emotional heaviness or baggage, I would say that's not a good person to engage in platonic touch with because you're not in the space of just making it light and playful. You know, it, it might get dark and that's not really what you're going for. The other piece of advice I would say is ask yourself if this is a person that you feel would help you out if you were in a major jam or a crisis in your life. Now, this is a kind of a tricky one because um, now, obviously, this doesn't apply. Like if you're planning on going to a cuddle party with a bunch of people that you don't know, you can't ask yourself this kind of question. This question is more for if you're just considering 
okay, I really just want to phone up a friend and ask them if they'd be interested in doing this maybe next, you know, Friday night or something, and you're kind of going through your list of friends, this is more of this kind of a question. So you're thinking about a specific person. Hmm, maybe, maybe Michelle is a great person for this. Maybe she would be into this. And then you ask yourself, would she really help me out if shit hit the fan? Would she be by my side? And if you're not sure, then maybe that's not a good person to cuddle with. Because especially if you're new to this platonic touch you it's good to go into it with as much um forethought as possible so finding someone who you just know is there for you you really trust them and that's going to be crucial to have that trust so that you can enter into potentially maybe somewhat challenging conversations that you might need to have to create the safe space okay so then in order to create a safe space, I would advise to have um, a somewhat lengthy pre-touch conversation, whether it's on the phone or in person. I would advise, you know, like um, a Skype or a phone where you're actually live time with the voice rather than just like email or texting because that that is not the best form of communication when you're discussing something that is really emotionally nuanced. So I would say talk on the phone, do like a Skype or just have, you know, get together in person and have a pre-touch convo and basically get together with that person or those people and discuss what you, what you want, what you want. So here's some examples of that. You can say, you know what I really like? I really like when people just play with my hair. Like, I really like it when people just, like, run their hands through my hair and, like, massage my scalp. I love that. Do you think we could do that? And then you ask, you know, the people or person if, if they would potentially be willing to do that. And then you also say what you don't like. You say, you know what I don't like? I don't like when people touch my feet. So when we do the touch later, could you not touch my feet? And then you talk about it. And you don't even have to go into why. You don't have to like psychoanalyze it. You just state what you like and what you don't like. And then the other person and people can do the same. <coughs> so you basically give everyone a chance to verbalize what they like and what they don't like. And you can also set ground rules for the interaction. You can say, okay, I really want this to be, you know, as examples, things you could decide between you. I don't want to make this um, include any alcohol or drugs that will change my brain. I want to just be clear headed and rational and, and that's the agreement. I really want us to keep all our clothes on. I really want to set up an agreement with a code word for I'm not feeling comfortable or stop. So one of the things that I learned when I was, um, in, well, I, I still am, interested in like the alternative sexualities world, and I know some of you who are on this live right now know what I'm talking about. There's all kinds of events and uh, different kinds of expressions of sexuality where um, one of the things is when you say uh, yellow, like a stoplight or, um, you know, like a traffic light, you say yellow to someone that is code, a simple code for I'm starting to feel uncomfortable. Uh, maybe we need to change something. I don't know what's going on, but I feel weird. I just want to let you know I feel weird. So something needs to shift. Red is a simple code for stop. Stop right now. So something has been triggered in me. We need to just stop what we're doing and just step aside from each other, take a break, take a breather, and maybe we'll come back and talk about it. Maybe we'll resume, but maybe we're not. Maybe the evening is done or maybe the afternoon is done. So if you kind of come up with like code words for easy ways of describing if you're feeling good or not, 
um, and, and with green, of course, like if uh, you start rubbing your partner's back and you're like, how does that feel? And they say green, you know, that means like green, go, good, keep doing it, you know. So you create different rules and boundaries in advance. You have this pre-negotiation, if you will, about um, setting up some ground rules so that everyone feels safe. Now, yes, within those ground rules, there's plenty of room for spontaneity and for um, being creative within it. But the thing to understand is when you're venturing out of typical ways of interacting with people, then having some rules is really can be really comforting because it's not just like blurry and you're not going to be worried if the other person is secretly trying to have sex with you or I mean again not that sex is bad but it's just some spaces that's not what it's about and platonic touch it's not what it's about platonic touch is about coming together with another human to love each other in a in a heartfelt sensual way with our bodies and it is beautiful and it is healing so that's what platonic touch is all about and in this when you come together with someone it's perfectly okay to say stop or I don't know about this, we, we need to talk, or let's take a break, or I need to change my mind. Maybe some of the, you know, maybe you set an agreement previous to the interaction and then when you're in it, it feels totally different and you say, you know, I'm sorry, but I have to change my mind right now. I thought I'd be comfortable with this, but I'm really not. And you understand that you never... No one makes anyone feel a certain way. So we are all responsible for our own reactions. So we don't have to take care of other people in a codependent way. Truly, if something is uncomfortable, it is good to speak up and say, I am uncomfortable. If the other person is offended by that, that is their issue to deal with, not yours. So we have this pre-conversation that happens before the interaction where we meet to discuss our ground rules and what we're comfortable with and what we like and what we don't like and we're very clear and open and honest about it. Then after the platonic touch interaction, it's a great idea to have a follow-up phone call or at the bare minimum like a text message exchange or an email exchange where you just check in with each other and you can do this like the day after or maybe two days after, but recent, you know, pretty close to the time that you meet and just check in. Hey, how you doing? How you feeling? Are you okay? Is everything good? You feeling okay? Because, you know, sometimes these experiences can trigger some stuff that needs to be processed. And if that's the case, then maybe um, you and your touch partners can have get together again and talk or, you know, um, talk on the phone or have some kind of, you know, more in-depth processing because maybe something was triggered that needs to be healed. I mean, getting together with people in this way can be very deep. And so we want to be there for each other. If anything comes up that we can help each other process, not take responsibility for other people, Right? Not in a codependent way, but just in like the sheer offering of support. Let me check my notes because I want to make sure that I said everything. I'm going to include some links here um, once this broadcast is over. I'm going to include links here to some really good resources for different ideas just to get the juices flowing on different cuddle party or platonic touch rules, boundaries, how to create safe spaces. These are really informative and I, I think they're amazing and they really can get you going on this journey. Um, you know, I've been having a lot of conversations recently with people about this, of course. <laughs> and what's striking me probably the most is conversations around age. 
So there's a feeling that the older you get, the less able you are to have this, the need for touch met if you aren't, you know, in a romantic relationship because our society frowns upon anything that, you know, goes outside of the norm of that. And, but I was talking to a lovely gentleman uh, just a few days ago and he's in his seventies and he was telling me a really nice story. He was saying how mm, back 40 years ago, um, he was homeless. He didn't have anywhere to live at the time. And a friend of his uh, offered to let him stay with her for a while. And they only had one bed, apparently. So they shared a bed. And they cuddled and they, they, they embraced and they slept together like all snuggled and they weren't sexual with each other because he said they both didn't have a sexual attraction to each other, but they just enjoyed like all this like intimacy and comfort and companionship. And the way he was speaking about it was so beautiful. I mean, that was like, a, it seemed to me that it was a major beautiful moment, beautiful memory in his life that he carried with him. You know, and he was expressing sadness um, about um, some of his current romantic relationship issues. And I just wonder what it would be like if we lived in a society where it was normal to see groups of people, you know, in parks, for example, just laying on a, you know, a bunch of 60 year old people laying on a blanket together, all snuggling together, just a big group of them. Like, have you ever seen that? Probably not. <laughs> I haven't. But what would that do in our society if we could express love and sensuality openly and it wasn't so taboo? Like, what would that, what would that society feel like? I want to envision that kind of world. So those are my thoughts, and I'm hoping that you all have thoughts too on this. So I'm going to see here. Please post your comments. What do you think about what I just said, and um, what are some questions that you might have? As I said, I've hosted cuddle parties, and I have done a lot of platonic touch with friends, with clients. I, this is my, um, I have some experience, so maybe I can help, help you understand something or get started on something. So what are your thoughts on this? <laughs> hmm. Is anyone out there, um, what, if you are one of the people who already know what this is and participate in this with your friends and loved ones, what are some of the, um, the challenges that you've experienced and then rose above or transcended that you could share with us? Or some of just some of the things you've learned about yourself as a result of having this healing force in your life. I really want to hear about it. <clears throat> oh, okay. Um, Sarah says, <clears throat> "Forgive me, my um, screen is kind of going weird at the moment. Sorry about that." <clears throat> Forgive me. <clears throat> I'll fix it. Okay. Um, Sarah says, It would be nice if affection was okay in public. It's true that it's not common to see people hugging in public. Yeah, isn't that odd? I don't understand why that is. I am sure there is wonderful... I'm sure if there's a historian in the crowd, they could pipe in and tell us why that came to be. Um... But it's, it's very weird. Um, 
we don't we have this taboo against physical touch in public um yeah it's not a common thing i mean let's be more specific though in the united states it's not common but i know for example in spain i have a friend who's from spain and she was talking to me recently about her and her female friends especially when she was younger like in her teenage years it's very common for women to be super physically affectionate in public like it would be normal to walk down the street and see a woman a girl sitting in another girl's lap like on a park bench or something like stroking each other's hair that would be completely normal in spain apparently that's what she was telling me um i know that in, I briefly lived in Puerto Rico for a while, which is definitely different from American culture, even though it's supposed to be part of the U.S., but it's a totally different culture. And it was really common to kiss on the cheek when you say hello and you greet someone. So that was nice. I liked that physical intimacy. So in other cultures, it, you know, it has various levels of okayness. I would say, you know, in some European countries, it's way more acceptable to have lots of touch than it is in the U.S. But then in other countries, it's even more less visible than in the U.S., so it's a spectrum. But I do want to be clear that right now, I am just speaking from my experience of living in the U.S., and um, it's different, different places. Um, Bevy says, you are a very wealthy person, Anya. What a challenge. I'm thinking you're talking about, you know, wealthy as in um, having an abundance of experiences and wonderful healing opportunities. That's how I'm taking your comment. And yes, I do. And I'm blessed and I'm really grateful for all the experiences that I've had in life. And it's got me to the place I am now. And it's beautiful. So, and yeah, it is a challenge. Um, I am putting a challenge out to you all. Um... You know, I am. We make a lot of assumptions about about touch. Um, yeah. Negative assumptions and fearful assumptions. And it's a tough subject, but I know that the time is right, ripe for change. Stacy says, I wanted to start hugging more, and I have, and people are very responsive to it. Oh, right. Good. Yeah, that's good. I'm so glad to hear that. Mm hmm Yeah, and, and I'm sure as you go along, Stacey, you can get, like, you'll be able to fine-tune your feeling the vibe of someone. Like, if they're rigid and stiff, that they're not the kind of person that you'd want to hug anyway because they're not really going to enjoy it, probably, or be receptive to it. So it's like, in those situations... I'll say, if I get the kind of vibe where I'm not sure if the person likes hugging when I meet them, I'll just say, like, handshake, hug, and then I'll just, like, question mark, and then they'll say one or the other, and then we just go for it. So, um, yeah, that's something that I do, but, like, if I don't know the person. Um, but I love hugs. It's one of the reasons that I go to, uh, that I love the Center for Conscious Living, some of you on this broadcast here go to this CCL in North uh, Northwest Ohio and it's such a huggy place like everybody loves hugs there that I, I think I mean everyone I met does so it's a really great great place to get a hug <laughs> okay um, yeah Sarah was talking about um, some people are only open to side hugs like like um, so here's an interesting little tidbit. So when, when you hug someone and you go towards over their right shoulder, so if they're coming directly at you and you go over their right shoulder, your two hearts are touching. Like your two physical hearts are then touching, which is amazing and so healing energetically. But it's interesting because what I've noticed in the, the culture here in the U.S., mostly everyone goes to the left. So, like, you go in for the hug and then you go to, like, 
you put your head over the left shoulder. But sometimes I just really want to go over the right and it throws people off. They're like, whoa, what are you doing? <laughs> because I just would prefer that side. That's interesting. But yeah, um, Sarah, some people do like these half-hearted hugs, you know, which is, it's fine if that's what they want to do. Um, but I think it's so healing to have that really good hug. This morning I had a hug with a friend that was really long. <sighs> and in my mind... As it was continuing t to happen, I was like thinking, this is getting really long. And we were in a public place with a lot of other people around. And I thought, you know what, I'm just going to let her hug me as long as she wants. And I just made that commitment or feeling. And I just was in the hug. And it just seemed to last an eternity. Oh, it was so nice. And then at some point, she kind of started moving back. And then I moved back too. But I think it's interesting to think about hugs and how sometimes we put like an internal time limit. Like, oh, if it goes past seven seconds or something, that must mean it's romantic or that must mean that we're sexually interested in someone. But that's not the case. Like, that's not necessarily the case. I don't know where we got these ideas from that a long hug has to be sexual or romantic. <laughs> Terry says, I have always been a very sexual person. I think I might have a hard time at a cuddle party. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, but you'd be surprised, though. I'm a really sexual person, too. And I thought the same thing when I first started getting introduced to the world of cuddle parties, that it would be, like, kind of challenging, especially if there was someone there that I found really attractive. So you bring up a good point. Harry, and this is something I want to talk about next week. So if you can kind of just wait a little bit, because I want to go into this deep. But what do you do if sexual vibes happen? Like you, you set the intention for a certain thing. Okay, this is going to be platonic. Okay. But then, oh my gosh, sexual energy arises. Despite the best of intentions. Like, oh my gosh, ah, it happens. So what do you do? So next week, I'm going to get into that. So I'm sorry to make you wait, but um, that's what we're going to talk about next week. But yeah, um, Terry, I would encourage you, you know, if you want to just give it a shot, um, you know, maybe if you could like set up a platonic touch uh, rendezvous with a friend who you know you're not sexually attracted to and you know they're not sexually attracted to you, but you know you really love them and you trust them and you're really craving that human warmth and touch. Maybe you could experiment and set up a meeting. You just like cuddle for three hours on the couch and give each other massages and just talk and laugh. And maybe that would be healing for you and fulfill different needs for you. I don't know. Uh, Keith says, what comes up for me is this. I have a concern how I would feel about touching a same, the same sex person. Yeah. Um, so that's a great question to talk about. So it all just depends on where we're at, um, with comfort. So, I mean, maybe for you, it, you know, having a platonic touch meeting, with someone of the same sex, like, isn't going to be fulfilling for you because you have too many worries or baggages. And I don't mean that to be judgmental. I just mean we all have baggages about stuff, certain things. So maybe at this point in your journey, there's too much, like, stuff that could be potentially triggered in a negative sense during the touch. So maybe not even bothering. Maybe just um, keeping your cuddle intimate platonic touch situations with um, someone of a certain sex that feels good for you that's perfectly fine I mean really this isn't about like platonic touch and and incorporating this into your life is not always about like working through these hard things like yes it can be a stretch and evolutionary to get good at to get better at communication and speaking what our needs are and our boundaries. Okay. But like 
there's just certain situations that just don't feel right for us and don't feel good for us. So don't, I, I would say, um, that there's no need to push yourself too hard. Um, it's kind of like yoga. It's like stepping outside of your comfort zone just a little bit is the optimum place to gain flexibility, muscle. That's like the perfect, just a little. If you step outside of your comfort zone too much, then you start getting shaky and you lose integrity in the posture. But if you don't try at all to move out of your comfort zone, then you're just kind of like, eh, you're just half-heartedly doing yoga and you're not really like, you're just staying where you are. And maybe that's fine sometimes. But when we're looking to expand and heal, yeah, stepping outside that comfort zone just a little is a good thing, but not too much. So maybe what you were talking about, um, touching the same-sex person is too much outside of your comfort zone at this point, And maybe it will change in time. Who knows? Thank you, Keith. Uh, Sarah says, touch isn't just sexual, it's healing and something we need as much as we did as babies. Oh yeah. But as you get older, it seems it becomes less okay a lot of times. Yeah. It's interesting, you know, they've shown that babies will die if they don't receive enough touch. They will literally die. I have someone very dear to me in my life who received little to no touch as a child and he is, um, he struggles a lot as an adult to connect with people. I received not too much touch as a child. And even now, I mean, you teach what you need to learn, right? So let me tell you people, like, I am still healing a lot of stuff from my childhood. And, um, I didn't receive very much touch, to be honest. Uh, it, mm -mm. no. So when I kind of started to enter this whole alternative world of sacred sexuality and touch and I was just blown away because there was all these possibilities that were opening up for me for healing and oh my gosh. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's exciting to find out there's other things out there. Maybe we can receive what we didn't receive as a child. And yeah, Sarah, it's true. As you get older, it seems it becomes less okay within the eyes of society to receive touch. And that is just whacked out. That is wrong. I'm going to say, like, humans are humans. And we have these desire, these needs within us to feel connected. And I will say also, too, in our society, our United States, we don't live in the extended family system like in some other places in the world. So, you know, we have the old people in the senior homes by themselves. And then we have the young people hanging out together. And then we have the middle aged or the like the families, the nuclear families with the kids. But we have all these like segmented society set up of society. And I think one of the things that that does, the way our society is set up here, is we don't have a sense of belonging and we don't have a strong sense of community and we don't know where we, where we fit. So when we create these alternative kinds of relationships, then we can create a sense of community together. Um, so I'm going to wrap up this conversation. Uh, because there seems to be something wrong with my phone at the moment because it keeps um, flashing in and out. So I do apologize that this isn't longer because I know more of you had comments. But we will meet next week, next Sunday, 5 p.m. Eastern. I believe that's September 2nd. And we're going to keep going with this conversation because it's a really important one. So I hope and I wish all of you to have full, abundant, joyous touch experiences, full of love, compassion, peace, and harmony. I love you all so much.